I think my dear friend and a great actress, uh, Franny, got caught in the, the way it sounds. Uh, but not in Rita Jo. Her Rita Jo was fantastic. And of course, ever since that, they've said, well, you know, you can't do this play. It's got to be an or Aboriginal girl, it does it. Well, sure, an Aboriginal girl that can act, thank you very much, you know. But she was fantastic. Or, or Chief Dan's family would never have adopted her. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, was, it was really something. So Augie, who played opposite her as Jenny Paul, was playing Chief Dan's part in, in this Ottawa production. And I think the mistakes they made in the program and everything were Augie's memory from the first time you know, with Franny, before they went to Ottawa. So this is The Ecstasy of Rita Jo. This is The Ecstasy of Rita By George Riga. Yes. And it came to you when you were running the theater, the, the Playhouse. The first day at work. Um, first day as artistic director of the Playhouse. Malcolm had taken the idea for the play to Beverly Simons. Because he was going to playwrights and say, here's an idea, write me a play. He took it to her and she said, this isn't my kind of thing, this is George Riga, take it to George Riga. So he did. And Riga came up with a couple of pages or something for Malcolm. I don't know how many pages, let's say 10. And Malcolm said, write, write it. And he, you know, he in other words, he, he commissioned it once. And um, it didn't come back. And even then, only in 22 pages, I think it is, on my very first day of work at the Playhouse. And uh, Charlie Evans, who had been Malcolm's uh, creative director, he was the designer and the lighter and, and was his colleague, he stayed with me for a year. And I said, you take it. He said, there's a playwright downstairs with a play. And I said, well, you take it home and read it. Let's read it right away. But I've got too much to do here on the he came in the next day and he said, I'm in the theatre to serve this kind of play. This is my, this is my heart's blood theatre. So I said, well, let's do it. What's the soonest we can do it? And we decided we could do it by October because it was May. It was the first of May I started. So George went away with a commission with, my, you know, I think George, Malcolm may have given him I don't know, the thousand, no, a thousand dollars. We didn't have that kind of money. So he made, we actually said, we're going to do it, this is it. And then I went for Bloomfield to direct it because I knew I couldn't be an artistic director and do something as important as this play promised to be in its outline. And um, so Charlie came in and said, yes, we, I said to George, we want to do it. Um, uh, who do you want to direct it? And he said, Bloomfield did his television show called Indian. And I had seen it. So I, uh, so that's what we did. We, uh, Bloomfield came in. Uh, he wanted all the fuss about it in later about uh, a non-Aboriginal playing Rita Joe, but um, uh, so it was George, George chose, we, we looked, Buffy St. Marie, anybody who was, a, 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 you know, a native, a, a, an actress of experience and some fame, uh, nobody was available. And he said, Franny, he, he, and he was right, it was wonderful. So then the board started saying, what's the new playwright? And we said, it's absolutely marvelous. And we didn't have it, we didn't have it. Uh, we finally got... We got an outline that the two Georges had worked on. We got the script. Uh, he asked for rewrites. And all of a sudden, about a month before we were to do it, or maybe three weeks before we were to do it, a new outline came in. You can find all this in George's papers. And it was a, an Odette's play. It was not the poetic thing that we had read, which rang bells inside. It was... Uh, it happened on Skid Row in Vancouver, and it was a realistic play. And I phoned George Bloomfield and I said, we've lost it. He said, you better come right away. So I got on the plane that day and went to Toronto. He read the play, walked up and down and read the play. He sat down and said, you're right. 
we've lost it. He phoned George, he said, get here, we've got two weeks to get it back. So we sent George Riga to George Bloomfield in Toronto and they holed up. And they arrived the day of the first rehearsal with the scripts in their briefcases off the plane. Didn't say anything to me. Uh, I think Bloomfield said, we've got something. Uh, who knows? So I took them down to the playhouse and they went in that rehearsal hall underneath the stage in the playhouse and I sat outside so nobody could get in. And Chief Dan was there and the whole cast, because everybody had signed up on the basis of him being a poet and a great writer, novelist, and they loved him. And so they'd all signed up for these parts that were in the outline that we'd accept him. And so I sat outside and waited and they came out and uh, most of them were in tears. They walked out. Um, Franny went like this as she went by. Uh, Chief Dan went like that. George was writing rewrites as he, as he came out. And Bloomfield said, I think we've got it. So we rehearsed two and a half weeks. One dress rehearsal. It was clean, clear stuff. It was. It was. Uh, and what was opening night like? Opening night was complete silence. Uh, they finished the play. George directed it in such a way that they came out, and they kind of came out as a cast, and they looked at the audience, and they gradually left. And they were up, two blocks up, having a beer, before anyone in the audience moved at all. No applause. People gradually left and went home. And there was only one performance where there was any applause. It was a killer. It was really marvelous. What was it like taking over the Playhouse as the first artistic director was a woman? <laughs> Hard because I was local. And everybody who thought it was wonderful and told me it was wonderful that I was doing it actually thought I would do it the way they would do it. So it was tough. How was it tough? Well, actors would come in and yell at me because I hadn't cast them, and, or I had cast them but not in the part they wanted. And, um, who is? Yeah. And, and City Hall got upset about some of the choices and it was hard, but not because I was a woman. I think more because I was Joy and they knew me and they thought they knew what I would do. And, um, you know, I finally said to the, the board of directors, uh, you know, the artistic director always gets blamed for everything. That's what we're paid for. We don't get any praise, so I'd rather just do what I want to do and take the blame for what I want to do. I'm not, you know, not in the business of being told what to do. They fired me. <laughs> After how many They took years? me out for no, it's not fair. They took me out for lunch. The chairman of the board and the new chairman of the board took me out for lunch. And they said, this and this and this, we want to do this and this. And I said, well, I guess you're firing me. And they sort of looked a bit puzzled and said, yes, I guess we are. But just a minute, there's something we want you to do for us. And they sent me out to find a new artistic director. It's lovely. I mean, there's something, uh, something lovely? wonderful about it. But anyway, I went out and I got three. No, I can only remember two. Bill, I got Bill Hutt interested in coming and David Gardner. And they brought those two people in, interviewed them and said, now if we have suggestions, are you going to take them or not? I don't know what they said. But Bill let, let it be known that if he was going to come in, it was going to be his and that was it. And they didn't want that trouble. They'd had that trouble with me. So the trouble you had with your board, because again, it's a good discussion for students to hear, the tension between the artistic side of a theatre and the board side of a theatre. This board wanted you to what? Well, everybody on the board, everybody in the theater, I guess on any board, uh, they fell in love with the theater at a particular, on a particular play. 
For some it was Norcold. For some it was Shakespeare. For some it was some Amel. I, I don't know. It, it, they fell in love. O'Neill. They all wanted to give to an audience what they had experienced as thrilling theater. And so they, so they talked about the play that should be done. So once I handed out pieces of paper at one point and said, write down the play you think we should do. And they handed them in and there was no, everyone was different. I said, what's an artistic director going to do? You know, read them and say, oh, good idea, we'll do that. But you can't please everybody. You can't begin to. And they were uncomfortable with your choices, uh, your programming oh, yeah. choices? Yeah, because I'd done, um, I did a play called The Filthy Paranisi, where two men kissed. Um, it, was, um, it was people you know. Uh, I'm going to forget their names too. Anyway, the two men. Uh, two very good actors, and it was a curtain raiser for black comedy because I didn't think black comedy was a whole evening. And then the other thing I did was Grass and Wild Strawberries, where there was the big drug scene. And the police were lining up in the stage door and filtering in, in backstage in case so they had to arrest somebody. So there was a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of stuff, and particularly Filthy Harry Easy was brought up by an alderman at City Hall. No, I, I, I got difficult. Let's go back to that story you were talking about, Rita Joe, and how, uh, as it was a performance in Ottawa, it grew. It was two years later. David Haber was, was planned that opening ceremony for a festival for the National Arts Centre. And the, it was redirected at that time by, by uh, David Gardner. So it was a different show, and it ended with uh, a big curtain call with... Uh, uh, all the leads coming in, you know, our usual way, and, and, and Chief Dan coming in, and the whole audience, which included all the premieres and Trudeau, because this was the opening and this was him entertaining all the premieres, standing and cheering and clapping. It was extraordinary. And um, then there was, there's some marvelous pictures of, of uh, uh, our uh, Bennett, Wacky Bennett, here, uh, uh, talking to Chief Dan and saying, you come to Victoria, we'll fix everything up but as far as BC is concerned. There's going to be no more problems with Rita Joe's and say, and um, no that's problem, a lovely no problem, picture. No more problems with treaty rights? With, with Rita Joe's. Oh, with, with Rita no, Joe's. No, the whole tra tragedy of the thing. So we're going to fix that. And uh, so it was hard because it was so exciting, theatrically exciting, and it was obviously a big hit, and it was the only thing at that festival that was Canadian. The rest of it was from Paris or London. And uh, so I remember, I, I, I finally, after all the celebrating, we went, I went to bed and I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized someone was standing beside my bed, quietly looking down at me. And, and I, when I opened my eyes, it was Chief Dan's uh, uh, son, Lenny, who is now the chief here. And I said, what, what's the matter? Is there something I could do? And he said, is it going to work? In other words, we always hoped, we always hope the theater will make a difference. And there was every reason to expect that this play had made a difference on this night with all the premieres there and with them applauding and shouting and crying, whatever they were doing. And um, he said, is it going to work? And I said, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. And, you know, it takes a long time for things to change or something wise like that. And he sort of sighed and went back. And, but the, the fellows who were in the play, I didn't think they slept all night. It was so exciting to be in Ottawa and to have the hope that a play I done it.